Janet's going away on vacation for 12 days, Perry told his in-laws. Larry and Carolyn Levine knew that their daughter Janet was having marital problems, but they were surprised that she would just leave for 12 days. Perry explained that they had gotten into a huge fight and she said she needed some time away. When they asked where she went, Perry claimed that she wouldn't tell him. She said she'd be back in time for her son's sixth birthday, and her parents felt that made sense since they knew Janet would never miss Sammy's birthday. It wasn't like their daughter to just up and leave, but they did know that when she and Perry fought, he was always the first person to call them and make sure that they heard his side. Though worried about their daughter, they accepted Perry's story and awaited her return. When Sammy's birthday came and went and Janet had not returned, her parents knew it was time to report her missing. Unfortunately, she had already been missing for two weeks. This is Monsters. Perry March was born on January 14, 1961, in East Chicago, which is actually in Indiana, at the bottom of Lake Michigan. He was the first of three children born to Arthur and Zipporah March. His father was born Arthur Markovich, the son of a Romanian immigrant. He changed his last name to March after graduating college so people would stop misspelling his name. After becoming a pharmacist, Arthur also served in the U.S. Army, spending three years in Japan in the early 50s. After returning from Japan, he switched to the Army Reserves and made it to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel before retiring in 1988. He would spend the rest of his life telling people to call him the Colonel and telling stories about how he was in the Green Berets and Special Forces and always had big talk about how badass he was. A closer look at his military record showed that he served as a pharmacist for his entire military career. Perry's childhood would be rocked when his mother suddenly died when he was only nine years old. A half-empty bottle of a drug called Darwin was found in her bedroom and her death certificate has, quote, barbiturate overdose as the cause of death and a note that said, quote, home accidental death. The first mistake on this death certificate is that Darwin, which is actually propoxyphene, is not a barbiturate. It's an opioid. Arthur claimed that Zipporah had been prescribed the painkiller for a head injury and that she had an allergic reaction to the medication. But why would she have taken half of the bottle then? Many family members believe she took her own life, with some believing Arthur was actually involved. The rest of Perry's childhood was fairly standard. He did well in school and lettered in wrestling and soccer. After high school, he attended the University of Michigan where he entered their Asian Studies program. It was at the university that Perry met Janet Levine. Janet was born on February 20, 1963 in Nashville, Tennessee. Her parents, Larry and Carolyn Levine, had also met at the University of Michigan. Larry was from New York and was working on a law degree. After graduating, the couple moved to New York together and got married. It wasn't long before Carolyn wanted to return to her hometown of Nashville, so the couple moved and Larry set up his own law practice. His practice became extremely successful and Janet, along with her brother Mark, grew up with a very affluent lifestyle. When she graduated from high school, she chose to return to her parents' alma mater to study political science and art. Perry and Janet had agreed to go to a synagogue together for Rosh Hashanah as their first date, but Janet overslept. She made sure to make it to their next date, and the couple were inseparable from that point on. Perry graduated with a degree in Asian Studies in 1983, and he moved to Chicago. Janet followed him about six months later. They lived in Chicago for about two years, while Perry worked as a management trainee at a large brokerage firm. Janet wanted to return to Nashville, and her parents told Perry that they would pay for him to go to law school if he agreed to move down. Perry took them up on the offer and was accepted to Vanderbilt University in 1985. On top of paying for Perry's tuition, they also bought them a duplex near the university. One side was for them to live in, and the other side was for Janet to use as her art studio. The Levines also tried to help Perry's father, Arthur, when the bank sent him a notice of foreclosure on his home in Michigan. 
The Levines bought the house from the bank and let him live there rent-free for a couple of years. When Arthur moved to Nashville, some say he was convinced to move by family and others say he just showed up, but the Levines let him stay with them and loaned him money until he was able to get a pharmacist license in Tennessee and get his own place. It's said that Janet got tired of waiting for Perry to propose, so she got down on one knee at Percy Warner Park and proposed to him. They got married in 1987, not long before Perry graduated from law school. Once he graduated, he started working for a very prestigious Nashville law firm, Bass, Barry & Sims. It's believed that the firm's large roster of Jewish clients had been hounding the firm to hire a Jewish lawyer for years, and they found their chance with Perry along with one of his other Jewish classmates. Perry had been at the firm for over two years and seemed to be doing well, but then a scandal happened at the office. In the summer of 1991, a paralegal showed up at the office one day to find an envelope on her desk. Inside was an anonymous letter that described how much he liked her body and how he wanted to perform oral sex on her for long periods of time. He explained that he was married and how he had previously not understood how a man could have an extramarital affair, but said that now he understood that marriage made sex boring, at times routine and old. The paralegal took the letter to management who hired an outside security firm to investigate. When the second letter arrived about two weeks later, it was instructions on how to get a hold of the author. It read, quote, This is an indication, if you ever should consider or wish to communicate, check out of the library the tax management estates, gifts and trusts portfolio number 134 4th, titled Annuities, located near the West Law Terminal on the 25th floor in the library. When you check it out, insert a library checkout card signed by you in its place. I will periodically notice if it's gone, so if, I will contact you and let you know how to reach me anonymously. So now, all the investigators needed to do was put a camera in that section of the library, have the paralegal follow the instructions in the letter, and wait to catch their letter writer. The paralegal got another letter, clearly giddy with excitement over the idea that she wanted to have an affair with him, and he gave her instructions to leave him a message in another book in the law library. She didn't need to carry out these instructions, though, because the security firm already had Perry on video collecting her library checkout card. Management at the firm called him into a meeting and gave him the choice to either resign or be fired. He agreed to resign and began working with Larry Levine. Larry didn't know why his son-in-law had left his previous firm, but was happy to take Perry under his wing. It was about this time that Janet gave birth to their first child, a son named Samson, who went by Sammy. Larry was also probably just happy to ensure his daughter and her family would have a secure future. By this time, Janet was on her way to becoming a successful children's book illustrator, and as long as Perry's secret from his previous employer remained, well, a secret, Everything seemed to be looking up for the family. In 1994, Janet gave birth to their second child, a daughter they named Zipporah, after Perry's mother. With a growing family, they purchased four acres in the Forest Hills neighborhood of Nashville and had a 5,300-square-foot mansion built. In August of 1996, police theorized that Perry's secret came out. The paralegal was going to sue him, but he agreed to pay her a $25,000 settlement, which by then he had only paid part of. On August 13th, he wrote a letter to her asking for more time to pay the remaining balance, something that it seemed like he would have had no problem paying, but everything they owned was actually paid for by Janet's parents. Him getting his hands on twenty-five dollars without anyone asking what it was for was probably not that easy. The police believe that Janet found the letter on August 15th, which led the couple to argue and for Janet to possibly threaten a divorce. A divorce would destroy Perry. Not emotionally, he was believed to be seeing other women at the time, but financially. He would be out of Larry Levine's good graces and it would tarnish his reputation. He'd be kicked out of their family and left with nothing. He couldn't let that happen. Earlier in the day on the 15th, two contractors arrived at the March house to install some countertops. They were the last people outside of the home to see Janet. After they left, Janet talked to friend Marissa Moody on the phone to set up a play date with their sons the following morning. She was the last person outside of the home to talk to Janet. 
At about 9 p.m. on the 15th, Perry called Lori Rummel, Janet's best friend, and told her that Janet had left. About 10 minutes later, he called his brother Ron and his sister Kathy, telling them both the same thing. Then, hours passed before he called Janet's parents at midnight. Why did he wait? It's unknown. Some people believe he was taking the time to make sure the crime scene was cleaned up in case they wanted to come over. On the phone, Perry told his in-laws that he and Janet had gotten into an argument and she packed some bags and drove away. Before she left, she typed up a to-do list for him on the computer, printed it out, and then had him sign it. Some of the items on the list were change burnt-out light bulbs, clean out the closet, and pay the housekeeper. Larry asked where Janet went, but Perry told him that she wouldn't say. She just said she'd be back by Sammy's birthday, which was in 12 days. Carolyn suggested that she was just driving around a cooler head and would be back soon, and the in-laws instructed him to call them when she got back, but she never returned. The following day, the housekeeper came to clean the house. She would later say that she found a lot of things that morning out of the ordinary. Perry called her ahead of time, asking when she'd be there, and then when she was cleaning, he told her not to clean the kids' playroom. Then when she was leaving, he asked her how much Janet paid her so he could write her a check. Janet was the type of person who would have just left a check if she wasn't going to be there. At about 8.30 that morning, Marissa Moody arrived with her son for the playdate and she was surprised to find Janet gone. When she knocked on the door, Sammy answered, and when she went inside, he started climbing on a rolled-up, red oriental rug that was sitting in the room. Perry said it was okay for her to drop the boy off, but it wasn't like Janet to not be there or at least call her to let her know her plans had changed. Later that morning, Carolyn called Perry to ask if Janet had come back. When he said no, she insisted on coming over to be with the kids. By the time Marissa came back to pick up her son at about 2 p.m., Perry was gone, but so was the rolled-up rug that had been on the floor when she arrived that morning. That room, which was accessed by a door at the back of the house, was the kids' playroom, the same room that Perry had asked the housekeeper not to clean. After two days passed without hearing from their daughter, the Levines began doing their own search. They called friends and family members, but nobody had heard from her. Janet could be a private person, but she knew her parents would be worried if she disappeared for two days without so much as a call to let them know she was okay. To also not call a single friend was equally as suspicious. They also started calling every hotel in the area, but nobody had checked in using her name. Larry and Perry both went to the airport and searched the parking lot for her car, but they found nothing. Larry wanted to go to the police, but he let himself be talked out of it. Perry assured them that Janet would be back for Sammy's birthday. On August 21st, Perry drove to Universal Tire in Nashville and asked them to put all new tires on his Jeep Cherokee. The technician at the tire shop would later say that the tires had 50% of their life left and he absolutely didn't need new tires. When he asked Perry if he wanted to keep the old tires, he said no. At some point after Janet's disappearance, Perry called his father, Arthur, who had since retired and moved to the lakeside town of Ajijic, Mexico, just south of Guadalajara. Perry allegedly told his father that he needed help with the kids since Janet had left him, so Arthur drove the 1,800 miles or 2,800 kilometers to Nashville. It seems that he was expected to arrive the weekend of August 24th. On August 25th, Sammy had his sixth birthday party at Dragon Park near Vanderbilt University. Perry and the Levines agreed to tell guests that Janet had been visiting her brother in California and she got a bad ear infection so she couldn't fly. They felt it was easier than telling everybody they didn't know where she was and worrying all her friends. The party was a success, but the Levines were sure their daughter would never miss their son's birthday party. Two days later, it was Sammy's actual birthday, and when she still hadn't shown up, they knew that something was wrong. They first consulted a private investigator named Henry E. King. Perry, Larry, and Carolyn all met with him, and he asked basic questions. When Henry asked if she used any credit cards, Perry said no, but he claimed that she had withdrawn money multiple times. When Henry clarified exactly when the withdrawals had been made, they were all prior to her disappearance. So all that meant is that she may have left with about $3,000 in cash. That was if she had been planning this trip in advance, which it didn't sound like she was. 
Then Henry asked to talk to the Levines alone. After Perry left, Henry immediately asked about marital problems. After having all of his questions answered, he suggested they file a missing persons report with the police immediately. Larry told him that they had one more private investigator to talk to the next day, and then they would go to the police. Henry put a note in his file that he thought it was odd that the family wasn't in more of a rush to report Janet missing. It seemed that Perry had convinced them that using a private investigator would be better. After their appointment with the other private investigator, Perry, Larry, and Carolyn reported Janet missing to the Nashville police. She had already been missing for two whole weeks. Perry told the police the same story he had told everyone else, which didn't give them much to go on. They started checking jails and hospitals in case she had gotten into trouble or had possibly been in an accident, but nothing turned up. A week after she was reported missing, the police found Janet's 1996 Volvo 850 backed into a parking spot at the Bricksworth Apartments, which was four and a half miles or seven and a quarter kilometers from their house. When investigators searched the car, they found personal items like her wallet, identification, passport, clothes, and her shoes were on the driver's side floor. Friends said that Janet wasn't a good driver and wouldn't have backed into a parking spot. They clearly believed that there was foul play involved, and the police agreed. Investigators got a warrant to search the four-acre March estate. They brought in a helicopter with heat vision and scanned the area, but that would only work if Janet was still alive, which wasn't likely after three weeks of being missing. Before they searched the property, detectives told Perry that they were interested in the hard drive from their home computer. When they went inside the house, they found the computer tower was open and the hard drive had been ripped from the inside. Perry couldn't explain what happened. The hard drive just happened to be pried out of his computer and he had no idea why. They would note in their reports that during their search, he seemed to have no interest in finding his wife. When it became clear that Perry was a suspect, he started going to the media proclaiming his innocence. I am beside myself that not only have I lost my wife and the mother of my children, but I can't even, I don't have people hugging me and telling me how much they want to help me. I have police saying you did it. The problem with his statement is that it's all about him. He makes no plea for his wife to come home or for anybody to come forward with information. Nothing about his statement has anything to do with finding his missing wife. It's Perry talking about how much of a victim he is. He also makes a statement on a television interview where he says, quote, There's no evidence that anything happened to Janet except that she's not here. Again, he's doing nothing to help find his missing wife. He's acting as a lawyer who's arguing why he shouldn't be a suspect. Now, if you're innocent, it's fine to proclaim your innocence. But when that's the only thing you talk about when your wife, the mother of your children, is missing, don't be surprised when people think you seem suspicious. During the investigation, detectives found out the reason why Perry left Bassberry and Sims and about the letter he had just written to the paralegal. They found out that Perry had purchased new tires for his vehicle, which he didn't need. They learned of the unusual rolled carpet in his house that disappeared by the afternoon and that Janet had a $250,000 life insurance policy that Perry was the sole beneficiary of. When they interviewed Arthur March, he told detectives that Perry earned his black belt in karate when he was 13 years old and continued practicing through college. Three weeks after police began investigating Janet's disappearance, Perry took the kids and moved to Chicago. Not long after, the Levines held a memorial service for Janet, which Perry didn't attend and didn't let his children attend either. Understandably, people believed that Perry's behavior kept making him look more and more guilty. Even after another search of the March property, police had nothing to go on and the case went cold. Not long after he moved to Chicago, Perry started a series of legal battles with the Levines. Perry wanted to get access to Janet's money, and the Levines wanted custody of their grandchildren. They did not want them living with the man they believed killed their mother. Without access to Janet's money and in an effort to get away from the custody battle, 
Perry packed up the kids and moved to Ahihik to live with his father. While there, Perry continued to give interviews to the Nashville media. In one interview, he says, quote, Hopefully one day we'll find out what happened to Janet and this will just be a really interesting story in my life. He might as well just tattoo, I killed my wife, across his forehead. Also while in Mexico, he married a woman named Carmen and they had their own child together. He claimed to be doing some type of law work there and was living it up while Janet's family continued to fight to find out what happened to their daughter. One of those actions was to sue Perry for the wrongful death of Janet. It would be a civil trial where if the defendant doesn't show up to court, the judge usually automatically sides with the plaintiff. Of course, Perry wasn't willing to return to the states to face his in-laws, so they won the suit and the Levines were awarded $113.5 million to be paid by Perry. Obviously, Perry wasn't worried about that judgment. He assumed he was just going to live out the rest of his life in Mexico, but his own actions would wind up putting a wrench in those plans. One of the last things that Perry would do as a free man in Mexico, in 2004, Perry sent a picture to the district attorney in Nashville. He had clipped the picture from a magazine of four women at a bar during the Olympic Games in Athens, Greece. He claimed that one of the women was Janet. When family members were shown the picture, not a single one of them could pick out which woman Perry was claiming to be Janet. None of them looked like her. That was the final straw for the Nashville district attorney. He had had enough of Perry's smug attitude and he decided to take a massive gamble and filed charges against him. It's a wonder how he even got an arrest warrant because there's literally no evidence connecting Perry to his wife's disappearance and there's no evidence that she's even dead. Despite that, in December of 2004, a grand jury handed down three felony indictments and Perry was extradited back to the U.S. The detectives that escorted him back to Nashville said that while on the plane, he asked about the evidence. He asked how they knew Janet was dead and if they found her body. Then he said he'd plead guilty if he only got seven years maximum because his wife in Mexico wouldn't wait any longer than that. Perry was given $3 million bail, which he could not afford, so he spent his time awaiting his trial in the protective custody wing of the county jail. While in jail, Perry learned that the Levines were given temporary custody of his children and he needed to come up with a permanent solution. It was there that he met another inmate named Russell Nathaniel Ferris, who went by Nate. Nate was in the next cell over and eventually Perry began talking about having someone kill the Levines. Nate was known by police as a frequent snitch, so they found it amusing that this was the guy that Perry decided to confide in. Now, most people don't trust the information given by a jailhouse snitch, but this time is different. When Nate informed the DA, they asked if Perry would talk to him more about the plan. Nate tells the DA yes, Perry won't stop talking about it. They give Nate a tape recorder and he spends the next two days recording every conversation he has with Perry. They plan out every detail. Perry will put together the money for Nate's bail, and once he's out, he will kill Larry and Carolyn Levine. Then, Nate can flee to Mexico, where Arthur will be happy to give him a place to stay. Once the Levines are out of the picture, his chance of acquittal will skyrocket, and when he's out, he'll pick up his kids and return to Mexico. Then, on top of planning a murder... Perry talks about how easy it is in Mexico to kidnap the kids of rich people and make money. Perry suggests they become partners. On top of the tape recordings, Perry gives Nate the address to Larry and Carolyn's house, the address to Larry's office, and his father's phone number in Mexico. Like I said, jailhouse snitches can't always be trusted, but Perry thoroughly fucks himself on this. And it gets even better. With a complete plan put in place, the police fake Nate getting out of jail with a reduced bond and they secretly put him in a different jail. Now they have piles of tapes on Perry talking about killing the Levines, but they don't want to convict him on a conspiracy charge. They want him for the murder of his wife. They continue to work with Nate, and with Perry thinking that Nate is out of jail, they have him call Arthur. When Arthur answers, he's like, Oh yeah, Perry said you'd be calling. He's already informed about the plan to kill the Levines and he's more than happy to help. Within five minutes, they start to talk about getting a gun. Then they talk about exactly how to kill the Levines. 
Arthur continues to give tips to Nate about how to get away with the murder, and then they plan for Nate to fly to Guadalajara, where Arthur will pick him up from the airport. After a few days, the police have Nate call Arthur and tell him that he's successfully killed the Levines and tells him when he'll be flying into Guadalajara. When Arthur arrives at the airport to pick up Nate, he's arrested and extradited to the U.S. Both Arthur and Perry were charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Arthur was looking at at least seven years in prison for his involvement in the murder-for-hire plot. The DA offered him a deal to do 18 months in prison in return for cooperating with the investigation into the disappearance of Janet March. Arthur accepted the deal and explained that Perry had called him and told him that he and Janet had been in a fight, which ended in her accidental death. He said that Perry told him that he had picked up some tool, like a wrench, and had an accident. Police believe that Perry may have struck her and due to his martial arts skills, the blow ended up being fatal. I think that's bullshit. I think they fought and Janet told him she wanted a divorce and Perry actively murdered her. He planned to kill his in-laws and go into business kidnapping children in Mexico. He was clearly capable, if not likely, to kill Janet in a fit of rage because his lies were going to be exposed. I think it was a calculated action that Perry decided was his best option. Unfortunately, due to Arthur's testimony and with no body, the DA wouldn't be able to prove the murder was premeditated and he would only be charged with second-degree murder. Arthur went on to explain that Perry had hidden Janet's body in the woods, but that the land was scheduled to be developed soon, so it needed to be moved. When Arthur arrived in Nashville, he and Perry retrieved the body from the woods, placed it in the trunk of the car, and drove into Kentucky where they rented a hotel room. Perry stayed in the hotel while Arthur drove around looking for a good place to dispose of the body. Not long before sunrise, he found a giant pile of brush, which was surely going to be burned. He dug into the pile and put Janet's remains and some other evidence into the pile and covered it back up. Police would later have Arthur take them to where the pile was, but it was gone. The burned brush completely cremated the body and the evidence. The first trial that Perry had was not related to any murder. Before he moved to Chicago, he had taken multiple payments from a client at his father-in-law's firm and kept the money. Perry was indicted on a felony charge of theft over $10,000. Many times, a district attorney wouldn't waste time with a charge like this when a defendant had a good chance of being convicted of a much larger charge. But the DA wanted to try Perry for the murder of his wife, not as a civilian defendant, but as a convicted felon. After he was found guilty of felony theft, his second trial would begin for charges of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. At this trial, when Larry Levine took the stand, he tried to bring up another time when Perry tried to have them killed, but the defense objected and the jury was instructed to disregard the statement. Larry, being a lawyer with 40 years of experience, had no patience for the defense lawyer and was not phased during the cross-examination. During Nate Ferris's testimony, unlike other jailhouse snitches, everything he said could be backed up by tape-recorded conversations. Perry can be heard planning the murder of Larry and Carolyn Levine. Arthur can be heard assisting in that plan and agreeing to house the fugitive. Not only that, but the prosecution is allowed to play a part of the tapes where Perry describes a previous plan to hire mercenaries to kill the Levines in 2001. It's important to point out that Perry is so dead set on denying that he's guilty of anything that he has pleaded not guilty to a case where he's on tape planning a murder, and he doesn't deny that it's him on the tape. His defense argued that Nate was planning the murder and got Perry so worked up that he agreed to it on tape, but Perry had to have contacted his father about the plan because Arthur already knew about it when Nate called. He already knew about the plan and was already willing to let Nate stay with him. That would have been worked out previously between Perry and Arthur. Even then, the tapes don't sound like Perry's being led at all. He gives Nate the addresses of the Levine's home and Larry's office. He tells him to kill them while they're together. He tells him to use code words with his father so he knows it's really him. He tells him the name of Arthur's dog and about his uncle Mike from East Chicago. Perry is leading the way in the murder plans and the tapes make that very clear. 
By the time of the trial, Arthur was too sick to attend, so the defense played parts of his recorded deposition, where he tried to protect his son by claiming the murder plan was all his and Nate's idea. But the recordings made it pretty clear that that wasn't true. When the jury came back from deliberation, nobody was surprised that they had found Perry guilty. When Perry March got to his final trial on August 7, 2006, he was already a convicted felon, which is exactly what the DA wanted. The biggest hurdle the prosecution faced was that they still didn't have a body. They had a witness who had seen Janet's corpse, but the defense could point and say, look, there's Janet right there, and when the jury looks, they'll explain that that is reasonable doubt. Still, there was a lot of evidence against Perry. In his opening statement, the DA reminds the jury that innocent people don't plan to have witnesses murdered. Then he moved on to present testimony by Carolyn Levine, who tells the jury of Perry and Janet's marital problems, and that Janet had a meeting scheduled with a divorce lawyer the day after she disappeared. It would seem like an appointment she would keep if she was that upset with her husband. The divorce attorney quickly testified to confirm that she did have an appointment with Janet at 11 a.m. on August 16, 1996. One witness was a resident of the Bricksworth Apartments who testified that he had returned from work at about 1 a.m. and saw Perry walking a mountain bike past him. The owner of a bicycle shop explained how a mountain bike could be transported in a sedan if you remove the front wheel, and said that a muddy stain on the floor of the Volvo looked consistent with having been left by a bicycle tire. The prosecution also played a videotaped deposition that Perry had agreed to a few months after Janet's disappearance. In the video, Perry is asked if he and Janet fought, and his answer is, quote, that's a matter of semantics. When he's asked if he ever hit her, he said no. Then when he was asked if he was in a sexual relationship with anyone other than Janet, he said it was none of the lawyer's business. He really, really made himself look like a complete scumbag. Due to Arthur's health, the prosecution played a videotaped testimony by Perry's father. He admits to having seen Janet's body and of helping dispose of it. He also admitted to destroying the hard drive from the computer. When he's asked why he did it, Arthur just responded, quote, He's my son. It is by far the most damning piece of evidence they have. Of course, the jury also hears about Perry replacing his perfectly good tires. The prosecution's theory is that he didn't want his tire tread to be linked to part of the crime scene. Perry claimed that he just preferred Michelin's. So, your wife has left you and you haven't heard from her in days, but you're so focused on having Michelin tires that you pay to have your perfectly good tires replaced? Yeah, that seems reasonable. The jury also heard about Perry's plans to kill his in-laws so that they couldn't testify against him in this very trial. The defense had no case. They pointed out that two of the prosecution witnesses, who were other jailhouse snitches, were liars. Both had claimed that Perry had confessed to killing his wife in jail. Their testimonies weren't the strongest parts of the prosecution's case. Otherwise, the defense had nothing. Perry's own father had testified against him. On August 17, 2006, Perry March was found guilty on all charges. At his sentencing, he was sentenced for all of his convictions from that year. He received 24 years in prison for the murder conspiracy, with five years to run concurrent for the theft charge. Then he was sentenced to 32 years for the second-degree murder charge to be served consecutively. He was sentenced to a total of 56 years in prison. The judge also rejected Arthur March's 18-month plea agreement and sentenced him to five years in prison. It didn't matter, though, because Arthur died three months later. Perry filed appeals all the way up to the Supreme Court, but none were granted. He filed a petition about the size of his jail cell and then tried suing to remove custody of his children from the Levines and have it granted to his second wife in Mexico. He was unsuccessful at that as well. He maintains his innocence to this day, not only for the murder of his wife, but of the plan to kill his in-laws, which he's on tape talking about. People like him physically aren't able to admit when they're guilty. Their identity comes from the lie, and admitting it's not true would strip them of their identity. Perry March will likely spend all of his time in prison filing lawsuits to harass the Levines. They won. They got justice for their daughter, and they got custody of their grandchildren. 
Perry will never give them any peace because he's a complete and utter piece of garbage. Or, I guess I should say, a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.